So we're in your uh, we're in your bunker in Mayfair. Um, what, what, what do you, how do you usually start a day when you're uh, when you come out here? Uh, I have to wake up usually out here. You know, uh, it's just near my house. You know, I mean, it's it's 50 steps away, so I I'm often in jammies out here, which is good. No one usually comes in here, and um, you know, depending on what I have to do. Um, I'll just kind of gravitate to start with something. That's kind of why every all the tools have to kind of be out, so I can start somewhere. And it usually just unfolds that way. Now you've been running uh, Mayfair for a while now. How do you? Uh, what exactly is music for use? Well, mostly we try to do commercial music for TV and radio and internet and games and things like that. And one of the first jobs I ever had was um, I had to program 45 minutes for a loop program to be played in a mall. Okay. And I, what I was getting paid for that was uh, it, it, within the same time period, I had to snore for Virgin Airlines. They needed a snore. They needed somebody to snore. Do you snore? No, but I can I can do a snore in a microphone. Good. Good. Like they didn't have a microphone. Like everybody has a microphone and a computer. <laughs> so why would they call me? The cost of the call was too much. <laughs> so I made twice as much snoring than I did making 45 minutes of music. So it's just the economy of the it's individual just, project. Just, everything is so different. From budget all the way down, every job is completely different from the last job. But if we if we're going to be general about it, I'll often get um, direction at five o'clock in the evening and have to show at least three or four things brand new for the morning. I mean, do you do a lot of exploring around in this room? I mean, it's, it's... I do. It's, it's set up like a jungle gym. Here's an interesting thing that I found out about being music companies. A direct, uh, um, a rep can rep uh, many different directors. A rep can rep many different producers. A rep will only rep one music company because the thought is a music company should ha should be able to do anything. Right. Which is interesting thought. Um, so, you know, we kind of internalize that, you know, um, and we've tried to, you know, be as wide as we can. Um, so that's a thought often is, is trying to pull ourselves, no matter how much I love playing the baritone ukulele, I need to stretch out right. a little bit. And so there's Make a lot sweet of that. rap tracks. Exactly. I've made some things that you would you. not believe <laughs> I would have made. You know, I mean, and that's the good and the bad part of the business. And in a way, doing that kind of stuff is terrible. It's a total drag. But in a way, it's totally a blast. A lot of people, when they you know, think about recording studios, they look at you know, these larger facilities that have you know, a, a, a big console and a big board and stuff like that. We were discussing this earlier. You don't have a console. You don't have a mixing console. Um, mostly for space, but how do you uh, how do you handle mixing more complicated projects when you're just dealing with uh, without the, the sort of tactile nature of a, well, a that, mixing desk? That part of it has just never been my focus. Um, this stuff is my focus, um, is finding sounds or creating things or, you know, being more in the part of the inventing part of music than the, you know... Um, Raymond Scott. Yeah, like just that. like... Be because there's everything's in here has something in it somewhere and you have to crack it open to get it. Basically it. Goujain. So this is one of them, but then there's two of these over here which are a little bit more... a little bit crazier. Whoa. Isn't that great? So... Like, how... Why? <laughs> and this is like a production model. They were like selling these. They just like invent these instruments. And they had this other one that was like a, um, uh, it's like a um, auto harp, but they that all the hammers bounced. Just like these weird, just like, what if this happened? <laughs> make it! And they would just like make them. So I have two of these guys that are exactly the same. This was from... Somebody who I'm probably related to had the basement of a building in um, Lincoln Park was completely decked out with audio and video gear from early 50s and 60s. Amazing stuff. He died and I went to his estate sale. These are all doorbells, different doorbells. <laughs> he did a lot of um, Foley sound for radio. Sure, sure. So this is totally... And this I've used a lot. 
I mean, should I plug it in? Yeah, let's do it. I mean, that's a drum set in a box right there. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> totally nutty. What, what kind of brought you into this? I mean, coming from uh, an artist standpoint and uh, being a touring musician and a recording musician, what? What drew you towards commercial music? What? The, the cocktails, um, we um, a couple things fell in our laps. I mean, we, we kind of played non-rock that ended up on an ad agency's desks. Sure. So we were we were chosen because of a song that we had created on a on a seven inch a long time ago, and the music supervisor happened to have a seven inch and liked the song and thought sure. it would work for the uh, for the spot. So um, you know, we got to go into a studio and recreate it to their specifications. It was a blast. I had a great time. That was the day that I said, oh, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Now, you did, a, uh, you did a record with your kids. Was that sort of a, uh, a, a natural extension of hanging around and making music, or were you going Svengali on them? <laughs> well, a little of both. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was just you know, one of those fun things. At that time, is before I, I had moved out here, I had all my equipment down in the basement. And so, you know, I was often holding a child when doing things. So <laughs> having them in front of the microphones was kind of a natural thing. And it was fun and it was a way to be able to share what I'm doing. You know, instead of me just always going away from everybody to do my little thing, right. it was a fun way to do it. And so, um, you know, the kids started to make up songs and we started to do different things. And they would sing first and then I would edit them. And, you know, we, we'd try to find different uh, creative, collaborative ways of doing it. You know, until they got too old to to want to do it anymore. Sure. So we had to have another baby. <laughs> well, I think that that's a that's a that's a sound strategy. It's a good reason to have a, a child, strategy. really. You know, these these ones are getting too big to cuddle. Exactly. And, and there's a, a at least in some of the circles that we all sort of run in, um, there's a bit of a stigma about selling your music to sell another thing, and it, it seems um, if you're creating it. For that intent and purpose, you're really not selling your music. I don't. No. I just don't. I have no worries on either of those. Yeah, I mean, I don't care. Yeah, it's a job, right? I mean, I just. <laughs> I don't want to pour coffee. You know, I, 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 if I can make music and 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 pay my bills, I'm, I just have. There's no stigma at all to me. They can use stuff that I made for any reason. Go right ahead. I don't care. Good. It still means a lot to me. It will always mean what it means to me. So that kind of that kind of stigma, I think, is always funny to watch from the sidelines. Should we record one? Record. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>